presentation in a broader framework. And uh, we have very deliberately um, titled this workshop mainstreaming because we do believe that um, unless we bring this discourse into policy and unless we can see implementation happening, we will all keep talking about uh, sewage and sanitation and, and the characteristics of uh, sewage without actually being able to make the difference that we have set ourselves out to do. So I think that's really the context with which I want to take Suresh's uh, um, uh, first presentation forward. So for us, the sanitation, as I call it, the sanitation agenda is the water, toilet, waste, pollution nexus. And I think it's time we actually placed the context within that and we talked about the water, toilet, waste, pollution nexus in this uh, so that we can move things forward. Uh, for many of you, uh, particularly um, uh, colleagues from India, you know that CSE published a report some years ago um, called Excreta Matters. Um, uh, we asked two very simple questions when we did this report. Where does your water come from? Where does your waste go? And when we mapped the 71 cities of India, both from a water and waste sewage context, we found that there were huge gaps in our understanding of what we were doing uh, in this nexus. What The first thing that we found was that planners were obsessed with water, but not with supply. And that if you looked at the water story in India, and that remains true today and has a major role to play in the way we talk about pollution and sanitation is the fact that today water is increasingly sourced from further and further away. It leads to higher and increasing cost of supply. It leads to huge distribution losses at pipelines leak. And at the end of the pipeline, you have less and less water to supply, which means that water is even more costly. And all this means, and this is something I'm not sure if it's true in South Africa, Jay, but I know in India that all politicians are obsessed with water, but nobody cares about sewage. And so in, in a situation where cities are not able to recover cost of supply, they certainly have absolutely no interest, no political drive, and no financial interest to invest in sewage. So I think it's also important for the sewage community and the sanitation community to make the backward linkage with water. Because that's something that we must understand that the water supply system of any city will determine the financial capacities of a city to also manage its sewage. Today in India, and this was a chart we did in Excreta Matters some years ago, and I'm sure Suresh, you were to update it, it would look exactly the same, that energy costs are becoming the highest cost of water supply. And the reason is very simple. We spend the maximum on pumping uh, water, both for supply and then, of course, pumping waste away from it. The other thing that came out very clearly when we did the report is that even cities, as I said, plan for water, but they certainly never plan for waste. 80% of the water um, that leaves our, I mean, that, that we receive in our homes leaves it as waste, as sewage. So the more water you have, the more waste you will generate. And yet we found that <coughs> no city has an account for sewage. Um, I'm talking about a time when we did then intervene and get the planning commission to start talking about the need for uh, sewage accounts in our country. But the fact was that even till today, we have absolutely no accounts for sewage. And as we know very little about the amount of water which is received in our households and the amount of makeup water which is received from groundwater, you actually have very poor data even on sewage because you don't know what your amount of water that leaves your homes is. And we also found that there was very little data on how cities will convey waste, treat it, and so clean rivers. In 2009, and if you will note, Suresh's data updates this for 2015, and there's a meager change from 78, we've gone up to 81%. So 81, no, actually it's a downward decline. 
So instead of 78% of the sewage, which is officially untreated and disposed of in rivers, lakes, and groundwater, it's 81% now. So you basically make sure, and that's understandable because urban populations are increasing in India. And as we increase, the catch-up game is lost because we are never able to catch up in this game of being able to provide the services for taking back the sewage, for treating it to a quality in a river which has very little assimilation left. So you also have to understand the pollution game is something that we will bound to lose in this. And what we found at that stage was that cities were planning for treatment but not for sewage. And the reason was that the entire obsession of pollution control in India was, let's build our STPs, our sewage treatment plants. But they forgot the fact that sewage treatment plants have to be linked to conveyance systems, and that most cities in India do not have underground conveyance systems. So you can build your sewage treatment plants, but they are not linked, the waste is not conveyed, and as a result of it, they are both underutilized, and even if waste is treated, it is mixed with the untreated waste of large numbers of people, and in all this, we lose rivers, and at that stage, we had shocked India by saying that India was a generation of lost rivers. And we've given cases of, for instance, Najafkar, which was, uh, which today Delhi moves only as a drain, one of its dirtiest drains flowing into river, into the river Yamuna. But it was the Sahibi River, which actually flew, uh, which flowed from uh, Aravalis and today formed a Jeel. But today, it is nothing more. Even officially, I don't think any one of us who belongs to Delhi would have even heard the word Sahibi, because that river has been lost completely. Mithi is known as a dirty drain officially in Mumbai, and yet it was a fresh flowing river. Ludhiana knows it as Buddha Nara, a dirty drain, but it was a Darya river. And I'm sure if we mapped different rivers of India, drains of India you would found, find a lot of the drains were actually a fresh flowing river, not even a generation ago. And that really is the question about uh, the fact that we all forget that we live downstream. And that's the, as I said, the nexus between water, between sanitation, between pollution. This is the nexus that we have to talk about. This is the nexus that has to be understood by policy. Because if we don't, then all our efforts to clean our rivers will go to waste. And at that stage, we had suggested the following agenda. We had said, one, plan deliberately to cut the cost of water supply. Because only when water supply is affordable can you have funds to invest in sewage management as well. We had said invest in local water systems because when you invest in local water systems, you actually cut the length of the pipeline. And by cutting the length of the pipeline, you cut both distribution losses and you cut the uh, cost of water supply. But all that will not work if you don't actually do demand side management when it comes to water because you need less water because the less water you have, the less waste you will generate. And the less waste you generate, the less cost of managing that, uh, that, uh, um, uh, that system. But then the next part of it was cut costs on sewage systems. And we had in fact suggested that government should not pay for water supply. It should actually pay only for sewage. Because it's when you put the emphasis on sewage management that you work backwards to make sure that your water supply system becomes most efficient, most cost effective. But more importantly, we had said, plan to recycle and reuse every drop of water. That was and remains the core agenda of CSC when it comes to water, waste, and pollution. For us, the issue of fecal sludge management, for us the issue of sanitation fits into this broader view of looking at water, sanitation, waste, and turning it into a resource. 
Now this is where our more recent work of excreta matters too, if I can call it that, which is that it's the water, the toilet, which is the sanitation, but it's the septage, sewage, treatment, and reuse nexus that we need to talk about. So not only do we need to talk about the water, sanitation, waste, and pollution nexus, but actually with the work that we have done now, we are reinventing it or elaborating it further to say that the real nexus is water, toilet, septage, sewage, treatment, but then reuse. And that will, in fact, if I was to add to it, I would put an equal sign there and say that will equal to pollution control. So that would really be the way I believe we need to reframe this agenda so that we have a broader context within which our work fits in and we know where are we headed towards. Now the first count of toilets that happened in India, and that um, uh, a real count of toilets, which is the toilet and its connection, happened post the work that we were doing in excreta matters, where we worked with the um, census uh, the department to actually come up with a much better system of uh, enumerating the toilet itself. If you look at 2001, the way toilets were classified was a complete mess because the census officials didn't really understand the difference between a receptacle, a conveyance system, and in fact, if I was to talk about it in today's context, I would say this 2011 needs to be updated further to make that last link about not just where does the waste go, but how is it treated. But if you look at the progression that happened, in 2001 when we were working on this, the way data was collected in India simply said it had, people had no latrine, which is very important, access to sanitation is critical. But then they said service latrine, pit latrine, and water closet. So the only way to collect data was on the type of receptacle. But in 2011, the census officials understood that the type of receptacle is only one small part of the challenge. I mean, it's not a small part. It's a major part of the challenge. I'm not going to underestimate it. But linking the type of receptacle which collects our waste to the type of collection system and conveyance system is an equally important part. And then, therefore, the data that was collected in India, and this is urban data only that I have put out here, for the first time tells us and told us in 2011 that septic tanks, were, if you looked at the number of people who were collected to a flush pour toilet latrine, which is collected, which are therefore saying, these are people with access to sanitation. The number of households that were connected to uh, um, a pipe sewer system was about 33%. And I can assure you most of this pipe sewer system is actually open drains and not even closed drains. And most of this pipe sewer system has gone somewhere where nobody knows. Because it's underground and it was built sometimes when the British, sometimes when the, when the pre-colonial period was there, and actually nobody knows where those pipe sewer systems are. But nevertheless, technically, 33% of India is connected to a pipe sewer system. And at 40% almost, or 38%, is connected to a septic system. And then you, of course, have uh, others, which is pit latrine, which is connected to an improved pit, which in some senses, if you add to it, um, also becomes part of the on-site system that we are talking about. So if you were to estimate, and this is the best estimate that we have nationwide, you can safely assume at least 40%, if not more, because I would argue that a lot of the flush poor toilet latrine, which is connected in senses to a pipe sewer system, is nothing more than a tank in the house which is connected to an open drain outside. But because of the lack of understanding, it would have been seen as connected to a pipe sewer system. Now with our new understanding, the next census is something that we need to be able to get that further evolution done, both in terms of how the conveyance happens, but then now add to it also the treatment. And as I said, one of
of our key understandings has been, and a shocker, I think, for India, because you know you have to understand. I'm not sure of the other countries here, but uh, most of India, uh, most of the people who make policy in India live in a part of Delhi, which is uh, which uh, doesn't have any of these problems. So most of them don't even understand the fact when you say that India is not connected to an underground sewage system. When we release this data. It was an absolute shocker because everybody was busy planning sewage treatment plants with the assumption that like the British cleaned up Thames or the Americans cleaned up Hudson, we would do the same and that we would just simply build these sewage treatment plants and magically pollution would go away because all the waste would be conveyed, it would be treated and it would be disposed of. And it's only when you start understanding that the most of the country actually does not have a conveyance system and that you would have to rebuild it or build it and that you would essentially in a situation where you are growing so fast that the catch-up game never catches up because the minute you fix one drain, a second area is already ready to be fixed. And so you are in a scenario where you just have to think differently. Now this is where I think the more recent work that Suresh's team has done, working with Arne, working with Roshan, um, working with Dirk, has been, I think, very fascinating because using the shift flow or excreta mapping or you know sanitation mapping depends on which cultural framework you're in. Um, you essentially begin to get a more in-depth view of the sanitation story of our cities. And uh, CSC's uh, uh, researchers traveled to many of these cities to look at it, collect data. They did deep dives in some of the cities. A lot of the research is uh, in the down to earth. It's in the folder. So this current issue of Down to Earth magazine has a cover story on the research and what we found. And I think it's a very important piece of work because it helps us to understand for the first time what's indeed happening to this invisible shift story of India. It's a, it's a part of the shift picture that we never hear of. Because we know of official shift collection, which is the CPCB data, which is official drains, which convey official shift to official sewage treatment plants. But what happens to the bulk of India, which is actually the unofficial shift which is in sewage tree, in septic tanks, or in unofficial drains, which is not conveyed officially to a sewage treatment plant. So this is in some senses the first real picture of the unofficial part of the sewage business. And I think it's time we actually, and that's going to be my main plea to this group, you need to make this obvious, you need to make it open, and you need to include it in the official shift picture. Because as long as it remains unofficial, and wrong as it remains in the dark areas of our cities, you will never see um, a resolution to it. Our study very clearly showed, and I will go through the, the work uh, very quickly, and I know Vitush is presenting a more detailed paper on our uh, on the methodology and things like that. So I'm just going to touch on essentially what we found, which is not different from what you would imagine, which is that the bulk of sewage in these cities is unsafely disposed of. If you look at each one of the cities, my colleagues looked at containment, emptying, transport, treatment, and end use. And I'm going to go through these shift flow diagrams very quickly. Please just keep your eyes on where the red is and where the green is. That's all you have to remember. Because both the quantum and how safe and unsafe it is, you find out just by the size of the red bar, whether it is unsafe, then it is red. And if you can see something like Shrikakulam, it's completely red, which means all the waste goes into the neighborhoods, the local areas. And anything else, wherever is the receiving media, which can take the sewage. It has no safe containment, um, a treatment, or end use disposal at all. If you look at uh, Cholapur, I'm touching my glasses. <coughs> I'm blind without the yeah. uh, And as Suresh is reminding,
reminding me Sholapur is a smart city. It's a long way to go to be smart on its waste. Okay? And be very clear that any city which is not smart on its waste, and be very clear of in a city makes a toilet, but its disposal is not planned for, it's a cycle which will come back. So I think this is the message that needs to be given clearly, loudly, boldly uh, to people who are obsessed with uh, toilets. Um, if you look at Devas, similar situation. Look at Gwalior, some improvement. You're beginning to see some ways treated. But I've always argued this with Suresh, that unless you can prove that the end use disposal is actually um, um, of, of a certain quality, I'm not prepared to put the green mark. But for the moment, just to give you some color and not make everything red, uh, we have decided to give a little bit of green so that we can make the story a little less, a little more variable than uh, otherwise. You look at Katak, that's the situation. Look at ISOL, which is interesting because you do have a system here, it comes out very clearly. Our report shows and our magazine will have a store, uh, contains information about it. Here you do have switched uh, septic tanks, but you do have a, a system in which the waste is collected and is taken out of the city, uh, supposedly to a sewage treatment site, but our own reporters found and our researchers found it is actually in many cases dumped and it is taken just even down the hill. But uh, that's the other part of the big challenge is what do you call safe disposal? But at least there is a system more than Shrikakulam, which is all completely red. Um, uh, Agra, some amount of waste goes in uh, through the off-site system, but the on-site, very little. In fact, when my colleagues came back, uh, Bitush, did you go to Agra? Rahul, Rahul went to Agra. I remember him telling me, because my one question to all of them was that, how do you track what's happening in a city? Because this is the underbelly of a city, remember? Nobody writes about this. Um, so Pollution Control Board has no record of these tanker collectors. And they told me this fascinating story about how they actually found the, the people who collect this waste through a little ad in a newspaper which uh, said that here is an emptying service available. They tracked through the ad, they found the emptying service, and the emptying service was nothing more than a bunch of, you know, it's, it's really the underbelly mafia of a city, where it's completely unregulated. Um, a, the, my, my um, both Suresh and I had told them, go track these uh, tankers, sit on them, go try and find out where they're going to dispose it. And they essentially told us, you want us to be killed? Because if you think we can track these tanker by you know, having a conversation with them, forget it. Because they work in the dark. And they have no reason to come out in the light. And that's part of the challenge that we've had in even bringing this information up to here, which is the fact that there is some tanker disposal system. But where it goes, the information is very, very, very gray still. Tumkur, Delhi, uh, what is not understood in Delhi is that how much of Delhi is also on site. And it's understandable because a large part of Delhi, other than the Lutayan Delhi, as I call it, which is where most of powerful Delhi lives, and the gated colony of NDMC, which, uh, which has no clue where its own sewage goes, uh, most of the rest of Delhi actually has a huge uh, problem where it does not have uh, a conveyance system. And it's important to recognize it because we don't see this in policy. We don't see it in policy, so we don't practice a, a change for it either. I, but there are challenges with this, and I think this is really where this conference is, and Suresh has put that down, and just put it in a more blunt form. Suresh and I play a very good role because he's much more politer than I am. I'm much more uh, blunt and, you know, in your face. So we work very well. That's why we work very well as well. Um, the on-site challenge really is, one, that the toilet is connected to an underground box. I will call it a box because in most cases, my colleagues, when they came back, they told, told Suresh and me that there's really very little idea of what the quality of this construction is. Uh, the design of the septic tanks may have been known to a generation of engineers two generations ago. 
I mean, I keep thinking how much things come back in life. Uh, when Anil and I did the report for Dying Wisdom and we talked about uh, how water systems, traditional water harvesting systems in India were destroyed and how one generation of engineers had lost the knowledge. In some senses, what when I heard them talk, I realized one generation of Indian engineers, we've lost the knowledge of septic tanks because we just buried them underground. We thought that they were, India was on the trajectory of flush toilets and, and underground sewage networks and sewage treatment plants and magically the problem was going to go away and all this knowledge has been lost. And today, literally, their news is that what you have today is not septic tanks. They're just large tanks. And so these tanks need to be emptied regularly or most cases they're just linked to a municipal drain. And then as I said, the mafia collects the waste for a price and it's a growing and thriving business. I hope, Suresh, uh, you will take everybody to see the CSE office. The CSE office in Puklakabad is somewhere where we do our own uh, sewage management, waste management. But what I really want you to come and see CSC for is the illegal sewage mafia that operates outside our office on the main road of the Klakabad, where every day you can see large tankers collected and putting their waste directly into a municipal system. And it's important because we don't see this, because we don't recognize it happens. It's only when you bring it in front of people that you actually start noticing something like this is happening city by city across India. In most cities, in all cities, and I will underline this, other than the few cases that we have found, very, very small and informal mark, there is no system for safe disposal of this waste. And in all cities, waste from septic tanks is dumped in open sewers, in rivers, in municipal sewers, in fields. There is a thriving private business. So one of the things I would, re I would ask all of you, please stop concentrating on the transport business of septic systems. When Suresh took me to Hanoi, and Ane, you will remember this, I found that the FSM debate was all about the private business for transportation. And I was very frustrated because I said, that will get organized. The problem I have is the common business of treatment. And that's the more difficult part of the challenge. So we need to actually think about how we will do safe disposal and reuse and stop looking at business models for transportation. That will, if I know India, and if I know entrepreneurial India, that will happen. But if I know India, then the treatment, which is the common business, will never happen. So I think that's where policy needs to concentrate. If you look at this, we found, my colleagues found this just at the outskirts of Delhi, in Loni, where huge numbers of tankers come, and they basically dump their waste into fields. In another place, we found it being waste directly into what is called a water drain. Uh, it's a storm water drain which flows along a, a road and has never been planned for the dumping of so much sewage over there. We found this picture from Sholapur where a tanker is simply going and dumping it on a sordid waste dump. Now if you look at the pictures that my colleagues have brought back from all of India, you will find that it's all over. And in most cases, we don't have pictures because, as I said, this business is operated best in the darkness of the night. It is not operated in, in light, which means that it, you, to get pictures requires an investigative journalism and courage that even we at CSC have not found yet. Okay? With, I, am a little, I am a little unhappy about that because I do want to track this business. So next time we will give you a better pictures of the business at night. But in all this, the bottom line is we cannot clean India, we cannot clean Ganga unless 
we join these dots, the excreta dots. As I said, in fact, I was thinking today, it's not the dots, it's really the nexus that we need to talk about. This is the new global nexus that we should be talking about. We've talked a lot about the water, food, energy nexus, but very few people have really understood the nexus and talked about it and found solutions for the nexus that really matters the most for us, which is that you need to make the toilets, but they need to be linked to a disposal and treatment system. And I say this particularly because India has uh, huge programs, which Suresh talked about, the ODF, the Swachh Bharat, the Amrut, the Ganga Mission, and in all of them, we need to bring one convergence, which is that the toilet has to be linked to the conveyance and the disposal systems. And that in today's India, where a large part of it is not underground sewerage, you will have to think differently. Today, the entire discourse is either on making the toilet or making the sewage treatment plant. But as I said, you are not, you, the policy is not designed to plan for the fact that we cannot have conveyance. And as a result of it, people are building septic tanks, but there is no official conveyance, there is no official treatment, and the end result is pollution. The story of Ganga is exactly the same. You look at the pollution of the river, you look at how polluted the river is getting each year, you look at the red band, you will see even the cleaner stretches of the river are getting more and more contaminated, even as dilution uh, decreases, which is obviously one major part of the challenge, but the major pollution challenge is that the STPs are a catch-up game which never can catch up. You look at 2009, 2012, you will find that we build more sewage treatment plants, but even officially you find that the gap remains the same. But the worst is that the sewage generation is underestimated, exactly for the reasons that I talked about earlier, that you have huge amount of sewage which is unofficial because it's not trapped in the official drain. So in Ganga, the only time you've had an estimation is because the pollution control boards have actually looked at pollution as it leaves the city. Now the gap is huge. It's a 95% untreated waste gap in the city of Uttarakhand if you look at it from that point of view. Because you have one estimation which is done on the official drain and the other estimation done on the drain which actually leaves the city. And that's really where the septic systems play a huge role. And obviously this happens because, as I said earlier, underground sewerage just does not exist. And in the Ganga Basin cities, this is the excreta map or the shift flow diagram that uh, Suresh showed you earlier. But if you look at it, not treated, unknown where it goes is 61%. And the opportunity, and I will end with this, the opportunity in my view is to reinvent the future sanitation solution. You know, we love to tell one story in India, which is the mobile phone revolution. We keep saying we have more mobile phones than human toilets. But one of the stories and the logical end of that story is that India really jump, skipped, and leapfrogged the landline grid route to connectivity in telephones, and now we are talking about it for energy access. We are all saying that instead of India building large grids and taking solar energy to homes, which is highly expensive, why can't we have off-grid energy systems? Because they are far more cost effective, brings the energy homes, brings the customer to the supplier, makes demand side management better, makes pricing better. That's the logic of mobile phones. That's the logic of, of energy. It, why is it that we don't talk about the same logic when it comes to sanitation? We know that the off-site system, the on-site systems are cost effective. We don't need to plan for underground sewage or door-to-door -door conveyance. People are managers. To me, this is the biggest game changer in India's waste story is NIMBY, not in my backyards. Today, major cities of India are reinventing solid waste management, not because the Prime Minister said clean up India, but because they have no place to send their waste. And so the villagers where they were sending their waste are saying, not in my backyard. And that is 
forcing cities as rich as Tiruvannathapuram to rethink their own way story. So for me, NIMBY is a powerful tool as an environmentalist. The only thing is that we need to reinvent NIMBY so that the poor are the ones who say, not in my backyard, not the rich. But the fact is that when it comes to on-site systems, people are managers. Because if the septic tank is overflowing, then NIMBY kicks in. And most importantly, these systems already exist. So you don't have to re-engineer the entire city for sewage networks. And that's the huge opportunity that we have. But to do this, you need to do the following. You need recognition. One of the biggest issues is that we have still not recognized on site in the future sanitation story of India. Because everybody sees this as a temporary solution, which is before you get rich, you use them. Think of another analogy. We are talking about air pollution in Delhi. And we are saying to people in Delhi, think of the bicycle, think of the bus, think of walking, not as the solution of the past when you were poor, but the solution of the future when and because you are rich. So you need to place on-site sanitation in that same vision. Don't think about it as a solution of people when they are poor. Think about it as the solution because they are rich, because it makes more sense. But this means that you need regulations for construction, for collection and technologies, and for treatment. And you need technologies for disposal and reuse. And that's really where all of us come in. We need to see our work placed within this context of taking the sanitation nexus to the next level. And seeing our work within that to say, this is how we fit in. And the opportunity is also to be able to place this within the reuse context. Today, everybody is talking about the circular economy. Everybody is talking about efficient economies of the future means that they most they are the most reused economies. But yet we know that the water-based systems invented by the British and by all other <coughs> societies because they were water flatulent are the most senseless systems from an ecological perspective. You use water to flush a little bit of human excreta, which is full of nitrogen, and uh, which is uh, full of nutrients. You use water as a conveyance and then water as a disposal. And this is, a, we talk about the carbon cycle, we never talk about the nitrogen cycle of the world. And this is the nitrogen cycle which is being disrupted. Nutrients are lost, food security is lost, water is polluted. So we need to place land-based sewerage systems as a repair system, as the answer. We all talk about low carbon growth. Why are we not talking about high nutrient growth? We need to talk about this and take it out of the back rooms of toilet fixers into the real world of talking about how we are going to fix more efficient economies. And as I said, you have the nutrient food excreta, nutrient food challenge. And the advantage is that because of septic tanks, and this is going to be one of the big issues that I know the next session will talk about the quality of the waste that comes out. But the one advantage is that you can actually make sure that your waste is segregated. Because the one is biggest challenge of sewage management in the world is that you get different qualities of sewer, sewage, which you get chemical waste, you get all sorts of waste, which means treatment is difficult. You also know that excreta can be used as nutrients for soil, reused in agriculture, and composted. So one of the things that we as a community should not do is to give a bad name for reuse in agriculture. What we need to talk about is what is the best practice what is the primary treatment required? Who will pay for it? And how will the city re regulate reuse? So the language right from the beginning cannot be driven by Scandinavia or Germany. And I'm saying this with Arne sitting right in front of me. I do not want obsession about uh, BODs and polyforms and all the rest of it and saying, oh, you know, people will die. People will die, yes, but we need to fix that, okay? 
and not say it's bad policy. So we need to bring, we cannot let this happen as the organic agriculture businesses happen, that you first make organic, uh, agriculture sterile and then you make it a little organic. Okay? This cannot be the same story. And I think that's got to be one of our biggest challenges. So the common agenda for us is to link Clean India funds to water sanitation plans. You need to make sure that the governments take cognizance of the fact that you need city sanitation plans. You cannot do toilets without planning. You cannot do toilets without conveyance systems planning for reuse. And you need to include on-site regulation in city sanitation plans. But the bottom line is, and I want to stress this again, the research on best practice regulation and technologies must be so that they are affordable, because only when they are affordable will they be sustainable in our world. So please be very clear about this. Affordability is part of the sustainability challenge. And I want to end my talk with just the fact that and this is a joke that nobody from outside will get. 